Eric Opera, Pro Musica Bangkok, and many others. Since 2017, Howard has been working for programming and production at the mm -hmm. Yong Siu To Conservatoire of Music, a department that mm -hmm. facilitates some 200 public-facing events in a, annually. In this capacity, Howard has curated multimedia projects, created marketing campaign, program events, as well as execute production for the conservatoire. So without further ado, let us invite Mr. Howard Ng for the interview. Hello, Mr. Howard. How are you? Hi, Adi. Hi. Nice to talk to you. Hi. So, uh, uh, how's the weather over there in Singapore? Oh, we just had a terrible storm earlier today. Um, but otherwise, uh, things uh, seems to be uh, what you can expect. The same in Malaysia now with uh, mm -hmm. COVID-19 and everything. Uh, things are just sort of on a standstill. Nothing much is moving. Yeah. So the the virus has been very bad for everyone. Yeah. It it has been bad for the economy and the music industry nowadays. Absolutely. Um, the entertainment industry uh, for our viewers uh, back at home. Mm -hmm. I'm sure many of us tonight who are watching are. Uh, uh, stakeholders in the music industry and uh, there's really no need to to explain further to elaborate further how bad the situation is at the moment um, with uh, what most people understand of course is that with uh, music performance or with the entertainment industry everything that encapsulates the performance industry that supports the industry um, translates to hundreds or thousands of jobs around the country, not just in Singapore, where I now live, but uh, also in Malaysia. And so if you have a performance cancelled, it means that not only do the performance not have work, um, people who surround the economy, who surround the infrastructure that allow the performance to happen, will also lose their work. So it's uh, quite crazy, quite, quite a crazy time. Yes. All right. So today's topic is about programming and production of live concert. Can you share about your experience on these topics, Mr. Howard? Sure thing. So um, when uh, JPO, Jesuit Harmonic Orchestra, invited me to give this talk, um, I thought that it would be a good idea to um, share my experience on what I currently do full time. Um, and what I do full-time now is arts administration, uh, specifically programming and productions for the Yong Siu Conservatory of Music at uh, the National University of Singapore here. Mm -hmm. And I thought it would be a good idea um, to share with you what it means to produce a concert and what entails what is necessary to produce a concert. Um, a lot has been said about performance. Um, if you have been following some of the uh, presentations that has happened now through uh, JPO's uh, family series for MCO, um, a lot of performers have explained the process of making music and preparing themselves for performance. But uh, not much has been said so far about uh, the work that has to happen behind the scenes to make this happen. Now, um, to start off with, and I realize that uh, there's going to be a lot of laymen uh, in today's uh, webinar. A lot of you listening will not be professional uh, musicians, or you might simply be interested in music or interested in the Jesuit Film uh, Philharmonic Orchestra. Um, so I will try to explain in as simple language as possible what it entails uh, in terms of producing a high quality performance. So I will be dealing more with uh, technical details concerning a performance that happens off stage, that has to happen before, during and after performance, um, but less so what has to happen on stage, which is what uh, is really the role and the job, the responsibility of the musician. So what I do entails the work that has to happen behind the scenes. And I think we can start off by 
talking a little bit about curation. Okay, sure. Now, with curation, uh, curation, of course, means sort of um, the way that you organize an artistic idea and how you then bring it to fruition. So when you want to make a concert, you say, um, I think that for artistic value or for entertainment value, it would be a good idea to present a concert with orchestra, for example. And the orchestra would play uh, 12 pieces of music because so and so forth reason. Now, mm -hmm. you could say an orchestra can perform at any time and the orchestra doesn't need a reason to do so. Now, that is very bad curation. An orchestra or any group, any artistic organization has to sort of make a curative decision to say, mm -hmm. We have to do a concert in a specific way because we have to send our message to reach a very specific demographic of people. Now, if you do not have a fixed curative element, it is very difficult first to find your audience. And secondly, once you know this uh, artistic core to the concept of the performance, how do you then decide to sell your project or your performance to this very specific and very niche uh, demographic of people? I see. So for these elements uh, about curation, so what are the major elements that you, you think of, which is very important? I think firstly, um, beyond anything, firstly, the idea has to be sincere. The, the idea cannot be superficial. So as long as it has a very clear uh, meaning behind it, for example, if I did a program with orchestra, symphony orchestra of film music, um, that's a very clear idea. The concert is about film music and I want a very specific group of people in my community uh, example, people who like film music, who may enjoy cinema, who may enjoy the music that comes with it. They may enjoy music by John Williams because they like movies mm -hmm. like Harry Potter, uh, Star Wars. Um, it could be people who enjoy uh, Ghibli uh, films, uh, people who know the soundtrack of Joe Hisaishi. Uh, these mm -hmm. are compositions that have a lot of reach. So therefore, it then translates to organizing these artistic ideas and then saying, is this going to be meaningful? And as long as one is sincere about it, and then uh, there is no idea that's really horrible or terrible. As long as first, there is a very thoughtful and organized way to come to this. Yes. And now, um, of course, with the curation process, there is an idealistic side. And this is the, what we have discussed so far are all quite idealistic things. Um, we search for a meaning. Um, these are all very personal thoughts. They are not uh, really shared to the public. And these are ideas that you try to put into paper that come from, comes from mind. Mm -hmm. But then... Uh, the second element of curation would be that we have to push ahead and say, yes, this is sincere. Yes, uh, this is a valuable uh, artistic endeavor. Now, is it practical? Can we justify doing this for the sake of doing it? Because certain things are expensive. Uh, because certain things you know, if you produce a fantastic uh, performance of Beethoven 9, for example, mm -hmm. um, and you say, oh, I want 500 people in the choir because I feel that 
this way of presenting Beta 9 would be the most uh, valuable to our local audiences. Um, they would be moved uh, emotionally and it would be artistically very good for the musicians. But how much does it cost to hire 500 musicians? Well, it should cost so, like a lot. Exactly. So then you have to say, if my concert hall has a thousand seats, how much do I have to sell per ticket to make profit or even break even for the performance? Because we have to be pragmatic. We have to say, as producers of performances, does it make any financial sense um, to produce this performance? Because we can have the best artistic ideas, but if it doesn't tally uh, with reality, then this is, in a way, bad curation. And it is a little bit subjective. Some people might say, well, maybe if you took a risk and if the idea is so good that it is worth taking a risk, perhaps it is okay to go ahead without considering whether it is financially sound or whether it is logistically possible to make it happen. But I we see. know for a fact that this is, we, we know from reading history, we know from reading the experiences of other people that it simply is most of the time not a feasible idea. I see, thank you for that. All right, so what about the logistic and production? Uh, is it really, it's, is it hard to direct the logistic and production? How, how is it like to work on it? Right, so um, after the curation, I would say that um, uh, logistics and production, uh, in the, the better, I think the better term for it actually um, is actually the title of my work position. The department that I work in, we call it programming and production. And programming and production translates really to sort of the kind of work we have to achieve very objectively in order for us to reach this goal of curation in the first place. So we spoke about um, having an orchestra play film music. Now, once we have made this decision, we then have to go into programming. And programming is... Uh, the word sounds very difficult uh, in the context of music and art, in performance arts, but actually programming uh, means the same as computer programming, for example. So computer programming is the way that you organize information in order for the information to achieve a specific goal. Now, for musical production, it's the same. So after you have curation uh, done, you have a very set of very convincing goals, you then proceed to programming. Now, what does programming entail? Programming means that we have to translate the curation information into information that could become reality. So for example, if we want to do an orchestra concert with film music, what sort of venue do we have to look into are we doing this concert for live audience of a thousand people? So then we have to look for a hall that can seat a thousand people. And with a hall that can seat a thousand people, where are these venues? How can we collaborate? How much money do I have to pay the hall? When is the hall available? And if the hall is available, how many days do I need the hall? Because if I do a concert of film music, maybe it's a good idea to broadcast the film behind the orchestra so that the audience could see what is happening on stage. They could see the film. And so the experience could be more engaging. And if the experience is more engaging, it will be more valuable. And therefore, if you have to hold for one day, it's not going to be possible to set up a projector, to set up a screen, um, to set up the technical uh, facilities and infrastructure that you need to broadcast the film behind the orchestra and to make everything work. So when you book the hall, you actually, you might need three days and not just say concert day. If I needed the hall on 9th of April, 
uh, for the concert, I might have to book the hall from seven to nine. So this is programming. This is when we sit down and we put on paper to say, how do we translate this into um, the information that leads to the successful organization of the concert? So um, I use venue as an example. So what could other examples be? Mm, other examples of programming could involve the organization of manpower. For example, we know it's an orchestra concert. We know there's a thousand people who will attend the concert if we sell it uh, well. How many people other than the musicians on stage do we need in the venue to make sure that everything is run smoothly? Now, why do we say this? If you had a concert of a thousand people, there are going to be a thousand people lining up at the front door to try and secure their seats. Um, before this 1,000 people come, they need to buy tickets. So where do they buy tickets from? Who do they buy tickets from? How do they get their tickets? Mm -hmm. um, how is the payment system established? Do we use a ticketing platform? Um, do we sell tickets personally? Do we sell tickets online? So with programming, it encapsulates all these elements that could involve marketing, could involve ticketing, it could involve artist management, it could involve front of house, which means um, managing um, guests. So with the manpower that manages ticketing and guests, um, how about in regards to production team? Who is involved in the production team? who needs to be hired to be involved in the production team. Um, if there is the broadcasting of film, do we have to pay copyright for the film? Or is the film in the public domain? Can we play the film in the concert? Is the score under copyright? Do we have to rent the scores? Can we just photocopy some edition and just play it in public? Um, in Singapore, uh, there is a society called Compass that governs this and is very strict. If you play copyrighted music without permission, you can get a very heavy fine. Heavy fines, uh, true. Yes. Intellectual property is treated very seriously in Singapore. And actually, it's also treated quite seriously in Malaysia. Malaysia is not the worst. Uh, there are some countries which are far worse in, this, in terms of this. Um, in Malaysia, this is actually also enforced quite strictly, but unfortunately, to my knowledge, a lot of people tend not to care about this enough. Because once you're caught and you're fined, it can be the end of your organization if you're not careful, especially when it comes to very popular music. So this is what programming entails. It is identifying um, the manpower, the structure, uh, and the resources that are required to make the performance happen. All right. So, so after the logistic and uh, I mean programming and production. So, how do you deal with the timelines? Right. So, um, very crucially, um, as I mentioned, because you have all these very sophisticated programming elements. Very, very crucially, the, once you have the programming in tech, you then have to look into production elements um, to see what sort of timeline is required for your production. Now, say if I wanted to do a film concert of Lord of the Rings, I wanted to play Howard Shaw's music uh, together with the film. Now, in order to obtain the rights to the film and the music, uh, do, where do we get this uh, copyright from? Now, there are some very specific licensing companies and they may say that um, it could take six months, for example, um, for us to obtain the rights. And therefore, you then have to 
build a schedule which exceeds uh, a comfortable time frame, obviously. So if you're going to have a concert on April 9th, uh, as an example that I've mentioned, you're not going to start organizing the concert in January. It simply is too late. Uh, in my personal experience, even with very small chamber concerts um, that have uh, less than, say, 100 audiences expected, um, I would give myself at least eight months to prepare this. Because with all the programming elements and all the production requirements, um, it makes no sense to have it any lesser than that. Um, even if you were organizing a small concert that was, a, for example, a solo recital, if you gave yourself a leeway of three months to do marketing leading up to the concert, which means if you had a concert in April, you start in January to sell tickets, it means that the curation and the programming, in order to be of very high quality, it needs to happen at least a further three months before you start marketing the event. I think, in, in fact, I think six months is already sort of short. I've tried organizing concerts with sort of four months in mind. Um, and even then, because most people do not dedicate their lives to one single project, we, we commit ourselves to a variety of things. Um, where I work at the conservatory, uh, every six months, which is one season, uh, with the school calendar season, because we work at the conservatoire, which is uh, primarily an education institution, we have about 120 events in four months. Wow, so that's a lot. If you treat, yeah, it's really a lot. Um, if we include external events, people who hire a venue to make productions uh, in, in the conservatory, then we are talking about 250 per year. So in order to efficiently execute this, there's no way you're going to start thinking about production four months before. You're going to have to start thinking about productions a year ahead, a year and a half ahead. Because as a producer, if you say, for this project to be successful, for this curation idea to be successful, I may need to hire a very specific artist. For example, if you were going to do, uh, for example, a piece, uh, Turan Galila Symphony by uh, Messiaen. So you need a Andres Martino or a Tremin player. You cannot get this in Malaysia. There's no uh, Tremin player in, in town, for example. So you have to hire someone from France or from Russia. And if you want to engage a person who specializes in a very specific music or very specific piece, it is very likely that the whole world is thinking about the same. So they are going to say, I want to do this concert uh, in May of 2021. So I'm going to hire this person in May of 2019, two years ahead of the project, to get him to commit to that date because he is the leading expert for this specific instrument. And there is no other way to hire uh, a person of the same capacity. So it means that you start thinking about the, about the project two years ahead. So it's, it's quite... Uh, a serious endeavor. And so I think um, in terms of timeline, uh, yes, it is easy to say, the easy answer is to say that you start as early as you can. Um, but I would say the important thing to keep in mind is that there has to be a mindset of setting milestones or key goals within a certain period. So if you had a project that you plan to execute in eight months' time, you have to say, in one month's time, what do I have to achieve? In three months' time, what needs to be set uh, and going? And that is, I think, uh, rather, rather important for timelines to work. All right. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Okay, so let's move on to the question and answer. So there are some questions that uh, our attendee ask. So for the first question, what is your instrument before started playing oboe? 
Right. Um, before I started playing the oboe, I played a little bit of clarinet. Uh, I, I'm actually from Kota Kinabalu, although I'm streaming now in Singapore. Um, I was a member of Jesselton Philharmonic as well. But before I joined Jesselton Philharmonic, um, I was a school band member. So I played the clarinet in the school band at the Sungshin Secondary School. So that was how I started playing instruments. And then one day, uh, there was an opportunity to play the oboe. So that's what I did. And that led me to play with the orchestra. And the rest is history. Yeah. All right. Okay. Uh, let's move on to the next question. By anonymous attendee, talking about budgeting and hiring post-production, how do you normally decide on a budget before proceeding? Um, can you repeat the second part of the question again? Uh, how do you normally decide on a budget before proceeding? How do you decide on a budget before proceeding? Now, uh, this falls back to the importance of curation. Because budgets um, are... It, budget, budgets are sort of a chicken and egg question. Because mm. you may not have the funding to make something happen, but... If the idea is good, funding may happen. So it is sort of a chicken and egg question. I know uh, people who have organized large scale festivals with no money, zero money, and they have organized things that require 80 to 100,000 ringgit uh, to happen within a week. And they have uh, started with no money, but because the value of the project is so immense that when they search for funding, people see the value in it. And so they say, okay, we will support this. And the organizer says, if I cannot crowdfund this amount of money within this period, I will not organize this event. So there are ways to go around the budget. And so budgets are really, on a fundamental level, they simply have to serve everything that needs to happen in the curation level. So going back to the example of the film music concert, how many people are on stage? How much do we have to pay the musicians for on stage? How many people are off stage? How much do we have to pay the people who work off stage? We spoke about programming and production. Do we need to rent anything? How much do these things cost? Do, need, do we need to pay the ticketing agent? Do we need to pay advertisers, newspapers, uh, media? And when we gather all these expenses, this is how we start with the budget. This, we, this is how we say, how do we break even? This is the amount of income or donations or public funding that we require for this event to happen. And then we have the answer to budgeting. Okay, thank you so much for the answer. All right, for the next question by anonymous attendee. So can you share some experience or your thought on which way selling tickets much, uh, is much more easier? Now, um, there's no such thing as free lunch. And so when you're selling tickets, again, it is again going back to programming and about manpower and about budgets and about costing. If you want to sell tickets, you can go the traditional way, which is I have 100 tickets. Let's take 100 tickets and meet and ask as many people as possible whether they want the tickets. And this is on a basic level what we all do. It doesn't matter if you're selling 20,000 tickets or whether you are selling 10 tickets. What we all do is we want people to know that we're selling tickets and we want them as much as possible to immediately buy the ticket. Now, the best way is to first determine based on your budget. Because if you're selling 1,000 tickets, you need to reach more people. And you cannot reach more people uh, due to time constraints that one may have. So today, there are so many useful platforms. For example, Eventbrite, 
uh, in Malaysia, you have several uh, companies like Ticket Pro uh, who run online platforms, a sort of e-commerce platforms who can market your event through their subscriber and mailing list and for a certain fee in return. So for example, if you sold a ticket for $30, the companies might say, I'll take 8% back from your ticket sales. Mm -hmm. And so in terms of budgeting, you say, if you know that this is a reputable company that can reach a total of 20,000 potential customers, you then have to say, if I cut out 8% from the cost of the ticket, can I still afford with that income, assuming that I sell out my concert to cover the concert? Now, I know this relates only to ticketing, but it goes back really to programming and to curation. Because if that, if selling 100% of the tickets after you pay the ticketing agent uh, can still help you to break even for the concert, we now have to expand the budget for contingency. What if I only sell 20% of the tickets that I plan to release? If that happened, after I pay 8% to the ticketing agent, can I still break even? If the answer is no, perhaps you should not organize this concert. Now, going back to the idea of ticketing and about reaching people, if you are selling to a hundred people, now, perhaps if you're only saying to 100 people, maybe an online ticketing portal could become an option and you say to the company, I don't need, I don't need you to market the event. So therefore, can you only take 2% of my ticket income? And they, can, and they will say, sure, people who use the platform, they will pay and receive their tickets through the, through the platform, but we are not going to help you with the advertising. So you have your portal, to sell tickets, but we are not going to have you. So then you can say, I have a ticketing portal and I can still sell tickets physically and I can go to people and persuade people to come to the concert. Now, how do we sell tickets more effectively? Um, for a smaller scale concert, I have to say that the most effective way is really still by word of mouth. Going back to curation, I spoke about how it's very important that with the organization of concert, we need to be quite sincere with the curation element. And that's because if we are to persuade audience to come, we have to be really quite sincere with ourselves. If we have to be pretentious about it, it's very difficult to successfully persuade people to come. If I can't say what is really good about it, I really cannot tell others what is good about the performance as well. Mm -hmm. So it's very difficult to ask people to come in that sense. So first, the production has to be good. If the production is not good, why do you even bother selling tickets? True. Then how do we reach the people? So you can reach people by word of mouth. You can talk to your friends. You can sell tickets to your family members. You can sell tickets to your colleagues. You can sell tickets to your friends. You can sell tickets to your local community club, uh, to your local societies. And if you're only selling 100 tickets, it's going to be super easy because you may have 60 people in the orchestra. If everyone tries to sell one ticket, you have 60 people. But of course, um, musicians are really not supposed to sell tickets technically because their job is to play music as well as they can. Yeah. Now, that really depends on the scale of your project. If you're talking about a community orchestra, sure, it's very difficult to expect very high budgets. But even with community orchestras, say in Singapore, Singapore has, I think, to date, I don't have the exact precise numbers, but I know to date in this country of this tiny island of 6 million people, we have about... 79 or 80 registered organizations that run community groups. And I think there are at least 20 orchestras. 
wow, uh, community lot. orchestras. All of the community orchestras that I've played with in Singapore do not force their members to sell tickets. Everyone wow. sells on an online ticketing portal and works with a funding agency to ensure that their costs are covered. So of course, they have to break even with ticket sales, but there are several agencies that can assist to model yourself so that it's sustainable. Uh, in Singapore, there are several agencies like this. And so they realized also that if they wanted to reach a certain number of people, if they were using a certain hall and they have the pressure, pressure and the stress um, to cover a certain a number of seats that they have to use a, a larger, more substantial service. So it's a complicated answer, but uh, yeah. yes, uh, to put it in summary, the smaller scale you are, spend less money on advertising. The bigger scale you are, you have no choice. You have to reach more people. All right. Thank you for the answer, Mr. Howard. So for the next question, do you prefer to be an art administrator or a performer? Um, I, I like both. Uh, I, I still do quite a bit of both, although I would say 80% of my work, 90% of my work is in arts administration now. Um, but both are very rewarding and both have uh, challenges of their own. I, I enjoy doing both. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much. So for the next question, do you feel that you have a special connection with some type of music and which types? Um, I, I mean, I'm totally biased. I'm a classical music musician through and through. Um, mm-hmm. I was trained in a sort of classical way, not really traditional uh, because in Malaysia, if, if you don't start with piano lessons, you really cannot say that you are classically or formally formally trained. I, I never took piano lessons until I was 19 years old because I had to mm-hmm. do keyboard lessons in university. I was forced to take keyboard lessons um, because I, I needed the skills in, in tonal harmony. So I had to do yeah. keyboard lessons to learn that. Um, but um, yeah, I'm true and true a classical musician. So I, this is what I know the best and I do the best. Um, I love listening to all genres of music. I love Japanese city pop, for example. Um, But I cannot play that music to save my life. I cannot play jazz. I love jazz. I cannot play jazz to save my life. But uh, I enjoy all genres. But uh, true and true, I am a classical musician. Okay, thanks. Uh, For the next one, by Mr. Kenneth Chia. So, Mr. Ng, can you... Talk to us about the importance of variety in concert programming. There is not the same piece over and over in every concert. Right. And yes, uh, I, I know Kenneth very well. Thank you for your, for your answer. Kenneth is a flutist based in Kota Kinabalu, a very, very good flutist uh, who runs a music school. Well, he would have a good answer to this question um, because Kenneth himself is a very experienced musician and educator. Um, programming uh, has to curation and programming has to come again back to the topic of being sincere if you run a community orchestra what is your primary goal your primary goal perhaps is education maybe some community orchestras don't do it for education. Some community orchestras run an organization for the enjoyment of their members. There are a lot in Japan, community orchestras who exist solely for the enjoyment of their members who want to partake in the music making process. In fact, they have to pay a lot of money every year to be part of community orchestras and the money can be used to rent a hall to perform so that they don't have the stress of selling tickets to fill the hall to cover the costs. So there are many different ways of of modeling this. And so this will affect your programming idea. So if you are primarily focused on education, 
of course you shouldn't play the same piece over and over again because you learn nothing from playing the same pieces year after year. So of course you need new uh, repertoire or new uh, variety of pieces to, to you know, lift the spirits of musicians and say there is a certain technical standard that the musicians can achieve and I know that the orchestra will not exceed this level of technical capacity for this music. So we have to say in three months time, we have to say this is the limit that we can get in terms of the standard of performance. And we have to move on to the next piece so that no one gets bored as hell, you know. Um, but programming variety uh, also affects groups uh, that are professional. There are problems, uh, and this is a topic that we talk about very frequently in the classical music world. Uh, there are orchestras around the world who play the same pieces year after year, year after year. I mean, it's no wonder that in some organizations you have dwindling audience numbers. Of course you have dwindling audience numbers because the people who come back are the people who only want to listen to the same things that they play year after year. So of course it's important to vary your repertoire and to always come up with something new. And arts organizations, um, community orchestras in particular, I think uh, you could justify it a little bit more to play some of the same music. But ultimately, I would say that if you are sincere in curation, if your goal is education, playing the same pieces over and over again will not help. It is a good idea to come back to a piece that we have done before two years later, three years later, I do this in my own concerts. Every five or six years, I would revisit some old pieces because the quality of the pieces are very high. If the quality of the pieces are not high, there's really no reason to repeat it and I would not do it. But it really depends on the agenda on the, of the organization and what it hopes to achieve. But in general, I have not seen many situations whereby repeating is a good idea. Repeating is not good for creativity. Repeating is not good for discipline. And repeating is in general just also not good for people to become interested in the work we do. I see. All right, thank you so much for that answer. Okay, for the next question, my anonymous attendee, Howard, how does organizing concert in Singapore different from Malaysia? I would say there's no difference. Um, everything's the same. It just depends on, I mean, there are different expectations. Uh, in Singapore, the expectations of the scene is very mature. Um, you can do a bad job here. It doesn't mean it's the end of the world, but if you do a bad job, um, well, I shouldn't say it that way, but, but rather in Singapore, because the scene is so mature, you're always working with stakeholders who know exactly what you're doing. Mm -hmm. So you have to be extremely serious about this. Um, I was working backstage with a multimedia team for a community orchestra performance that cost 450,000 Singapore dollars. That's 1.3 million ringgit for a one night only concert. Ooh, that's a lot. So that was the cost of the production. And so this is organized by a, a community orchestra, not professional orchestra, yeah? community orchestra. And for them to achieve this, they have to take every single aspect of the production seriously. And, and so, Everything that I've said uh, in the earlier part of uh, my presentation, I think falls true no matter where you present this concert. If you're, if you're doing a small concert in Singapore or if you're doing a large concert in Malaysia, uh, the values that needs to be there, uh, they are held true regardless. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, I think this is the last question for this session. So, sure. did you like to be a conductor? Um, I, 
I did conduct a little bit. Uh, a few years back, about five or six years back, I was uh, an assistant for the Chesterton Philharmonic. I had a grant uh, from Kaki Sani and the Ministry of Culture Malaysia at that time, uh, PKKN uh, and Kaki Sani. I received a grant from that organization to train as an arts administrator uh, under Jesserton Philharmonic. And as part of the uh, sort of training for three months, uh, three to six months, I was also asked to uh, take up some uh, conducting roles uh, with uh, Mr. Yap Ling. Uh, I enjoyed that and subsequently I did conduct another three or four times um, but I'm no means a professional conductor. Conducting is extremely difficult. Extremely, extremely difficult. And so I would say that if you wanted to be a conductor, you could, uh, I would call myself an amateur. If you asked me to conduct today, I, I, if I had scores for a performance in three months, sure, I could do it. If you ask me to conduct tomorrow, it's not possible. So I'm an amateur conductor. But to be a professional conductor is a completely different ball game that requires full time commitment, uh, and so and it's very complicated. It's not just about uh, learning the music, but being a conductor is a lot of times also a very heavy administrative job as well. Um, so it's uh, I, I I enjoy conducting. I think there is a lot of artistic reward from conducting. But in general, um, it's not something that uh, I, I want to do long, long term, but mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm happy to do it once in a while. Uh, it's it's uh, a great experience. Conducting is really wonderful. If you have an opportunity to try conducting, you should definitely do it uh, just for the sake of the experience, even if you're not really passionate about it, because you can learn a lot from doing a little bit of conducting. Okay, thank you so much for the answer. We do have a bit more time for the question and answer. So uh, here are the next question. So sure. what would you be doing right now if it wasn't for your music career? Um, actually, um, I have a sort of music career, but also for five years, I was uh, working with my family, family in a property uh, related industry business. Um, I'm still affiliated to a food and beverage business in Kota Kinabalu. So after I left the National Symphony Orchestra in 2013, uh, where I was working, I actually spent about five years uh, working in a different industry. And uh, that was a re really good experience and, and I'm still tied to that industry, those industries very much. Uh, but, and so to the original question as to if I didn't do music, uh, what else would I do? The reason why I'm still in music, I think, is because I, I cannot answer that because I, I, I simply would not be able to probably and not because I am incapable of doing so, but because really the music industry is what uh, keeps me passionate and keeps me driven. Uh, but I'm also very interested in food and beverage. I'm very interested in property. So those are the things that I still have a little bit of connection to. Um, yeah, so I hope that answers the question. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, the next question is from Jan. So here are the questions. Hey Howard, just a question I had in mind. The world is changing and obviously concerts are evolving. Classical is mixed with modernism as well as Baroque with performance practice. Which direction do you think music is heading to in general? Also in Asia, general classical music is alive and well, but very different in the Western world. Would you say we are heading in that direction too? Okay, I think this is this is a very long question. is is yeah. kind of like a two two parter. Uh, yeah. I'll answer the first part. The first part seems to deal with sort of performance practice. I think Yen is trying to ask a question about uh, how people are playing music 
and what sort of music are people playing. Um, there will always be very specific, specific genres and there will always be specialization, especially in these days. Um, the really great performance of specialized music will continue to exist and live on. But uh, as we come now, especially with COVID, we see really every day on Facebook, on social media, we see top performers around the world who can really do anything that you desire. Uh, are online and creating content. And when you realize that there is a limit to the expansion of the industry, really only the top performers can really survive and the top organizations can thrive in such a difficult financial climate. Because if the financial support shrinks, then you have less and less performers who are able to take a piece of the pie to practice their art in this industry. Um, I would say that to answer the first part, uh, in terms of performance practice, I think just simply less and less people will specialize and more and more people will have to be able to do more and more different things. Uh, and I think even musically, that is the truth. You will see more and more people who can play in a variety of genres. Uh, I already know two or three pianists uh, of my generation who are excellent in uh, a variety of genres. Um, this is the way it is. The second part of the question, um, which I think uh, sort of deals with, actually I can't recall now, what is the second part of the question? Uh... It says, uh, would you say we are heading in that direction too? So the, the statement was, also in Asia, general classical music is right. alive and well, right. but very different in the Western world. Right. Um, I don't think it's dying in the Western world. It's just that, I mean, if you look at uh, YouTube, for example, uh, never in my life would I imagine seeing a video uh, of Mendelssohn violin concerto with 20 million views, for example. No orchestra can dream of having 20 million uh, people having bought their CDs for a single performance. This was not possible 30 years ago. It was not possible 50 years ago. If you had a very good distributor, your agency was Deutsche Grammophone and Karayam was conducting, maybe you can sell 2 million CDs of that performance. But now you can go on YouTube and you can achieve a viewership of 20 million unique views for a performance. So can you say that classical music is dying in the Western world? I don't think so. Mm -hmm. What is dying are very traditional ways of running organizations and very traditional funding models. So I know I shouldn't say this because as a practicing musician, I really shouldn't say we should have less orchestras. But the truth is, uh, the world works in a way whereby if there is simply not enough physical demand for something, uh, in order to justify the existence of something that costs a lot of money, it has to have a social function. And for it to be a social function, we then have to say that it should be a public entity. And therefore, orchestras like the Singapore Symphony Orchestra that's a public entity. It's funded by government money. It has a lot of uh, public uh, money. There is a lot of uh, private uh, money as well, endorsements, uh, donations uh, to support the entity. Uh, but, but most of the funding comes from the government. And so if you say that orchestras or certain arts organizations, if they serve social functions, then it's very difficult for you to expect them to exist purely on private funding. And so what's happening in the Western world is that they're getting less and less private funding, but they are also getting less and less public funding. And that is the big shift in the Western world. In uh, Asia, uh, it's the other way around. Uh, orchestras are really getting more and more funding from the private sector because there's a lot of thriving industries that are using orchestras to show off. 
you know, uh, big companies who can say, hey, I gave 20 million to an orchestra this year. And in return, I hope that the orchestra would do a lot of social work. So they have to play 20 community outreach concerts per year. But hey, they're not unpaid, you see. They're paid by this company who has pledged 20 million to the salaries of musicians for the next five years. So there are private funding uh, from companies like these who, who do such things. Um, until COVID-19, there were far many more. After COVID-19, uh, with financial struggles, a lot of companies have also stopped their support uh, to a lot of these performing arts organizations. Um, but I would say that it, overall, nothing is dying. It's just that the model, the business models are changing. Uh, the way that people keep things sustainable are changing. So you have, you see more and more, for example, in the UK, you have orchestras, right? Aurora Orchestra, uh, which is changing a model. They are not a full-time orchestra. Uh, they are on a project basis. They only meet a certain number of times per year. And every time they meet, they have specific donors that work towards a project for a very specific goal. So that's very different from say having 52 subscription concerts and having a donor pledge for all 52 concerts. Um, so I don't think classical music is dying. It's just changing. Hope that answers okay. the question a bit long, sorry. Yeah, yeah it's okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, so for the next uh, questions, hi Howard, what are the ways musician can help to promote classical and orchestral music in Malaysia with little budget? <sighs> Difficult to answer because yeah. I ask the same question every single day. Um, firstly, uh, maybe we should stop uh, being arrogant. I think this is the first step. Now, it doesn't matter if you're a doctor or a lawyer or a musician or, or you may be a hawker store owner. Um, there hasn't been a case whereby you don't have to explain what you do. And th there exist stereotypes for everything. So th the stereotype is in that if you talk about a doctor, what does a doctor do? It seems very apparent, but it really isn't. We, we say doctors, uh, they provide medical services, they, they diagnose patients, they cure patients, hopefully, if the diagnosis goes right. But that is really just touching the surface of the pro profession. If we understand this about other professions, then we have to understand that it is not too much for other people to come to us and judge our pro profession based on the very little that they know. And so I think the first step is for us to not be arrogant and to be open to explaining to other people what we do and to promote our work in a healthy and non-arrogant way. For example, if I wanted to mm, explain to someone um, what I did as a living playing classical music, I would not go into using jargon that laymen would not understand. I think that is not proving your sophistication, that is just arrogant. Um, I would not try to sell concerts to people I know who would not appreciate it. And if they didn't buy a ticket, I would not blame them because why, why should I? Um, I think that's a very important first step because I think as an industry, uh, we are quite, and I, I cannot represent everyone in saying this. Um, I can only represent really myself. Uh, I think I myself, I, I have a quite conservative view of this and I challenge myself on a daily basis to, to try and present classical music in a way that people understand because you have to admit that there are certain repertoire, there are certain pieces that you would not enjoy without some foundational understanding of classical music. Which explains why some pieces are played again and again, you know, because those pieces are so good that you don't need to explain and they will work. For example, Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. Bum, 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 bum. Bum, 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 bum. You don't need to explain this. 
there is this great polyphony dee -dee 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 layered around. It's so mm -hmm. exciting. And then it culminates. Bum, 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 bum. If, if you're first time listening to this, you've never heard the Fifth Symphony, you think, wow, you know, it's crazy. Why am I hearing so many different things happening at the same time? And then suddenly, the harmony shifts in a way so suddenly that it comes to the motif again, uh, playing in unison. Mm -hmm. It's such wonderful music. But if you, you know, you, it's, it's, it's just purely great. So you want to introduce pieces like this to people who have maybe not heard classical music before. Uh, you wouldn't be so arrogant as to introduce something extremely difficult. For example, yeah, I, I mean, I, I won't name any pieces because there are some pieces that I think people should try even though they are difficult. But uh, again, I come from quite a conservative uh, point of view. But I think ultimately it, is, it has to start from yourself. And of course, the more you talk about it to your friends, the more your friends will know. If you talk about this more to your family, your family will be more inclined to tell this to your, your family friends. The more people in your community will know what you do. And that is really the best way to spread the art of classical music. Yeah, hope that answers the question. All right, thank you so much. Now, a uh, question from uh, Susanna. Uh, hmm. How often do you organize a concert and what is the size? Um, with my work at the conservatory, uh, 250 events per year, I would say um, about 100 are concerts. The rest are not concerts. Uh, they could be related to concerts. They could be seminars like what we are doing now. They could be master classes. Um, they, they could be uh, all sorts of other things, uh, symposiums, conferences. Uh, I've also, I've organized uh, gala dinners. I've organized dinners before as well. That is part of my job as well. Um, I would say that about, uh, yeah, I, I organize maybe 120 concerts per year or something as part of my job. But outside of my job, I think it's, uh, I don't do that much because already I'm, I'm doing so much at the university that it doesn't make sense for me to do uh, as much in my own personal time and capacity. So I, I much rather prefer playing concerts outside of this time. But outside of this, I do organize uh, several other things like the Malaysian Wind Music Prize, which has about three concerts per year. Uh, I work with Ensemble Virama with my colleagues in Kuala Lumpur mostly. Uh, we do when possible. We just cancelled the concert because of COVID-19. COVID. Uh, but we do about three projects per year, which amounts to about six concerts. Uh, with the conservatory, I cancelled 70 concerts this, this season because of COVID-19. Is it a 70 or a 17? 70. 70. Oh my God, that's, that's a lot. So can you imagine I was working a year ago yeah. to organize the logistics for 70 concerts. And then in January, I am in the timeline, I'm halfway through half of it in terms of marketing, publicity. Uh, we have started ticket sales for all concerts. Uh, we have started publicity for half of the concerts, um, major publicity work. And then we had to cancel every single one because of COVID-19. So it's really crazy, yeah. All right, thank you so much for the answer. Okay, for the last question for tonight. Uh, hi, Mr. Ng. Which university did you attend? Um, I studied in two schools. I went to UCSI, University in Kuala Lumpur. Uh, it, it used to be called Sedaya uh, College. And I think now it's called UCSI University. So I went there for a year. Uh, I started my bachelor's degree there. Then I went to Yongsu to Conservatory after that, and I finished my studies there. All right, so that's the end yeah. of uh, question and answer part. So I would love to thank Mr. Howard Ng for uh, having with JP of program tonight. Thank you so much, Mr. Yeah. Howard. Thank you for thank spending you. time it's with us. Thank you, it's my pleasure. Thank you. Okay, uh, so you can end the video.
Okay, thank you so much, Mr. Howard, again. So, all right, everyone, we have come to the end of tonight's uh, webinar. For your information, our JPO family program will be broadcasted every night until the 14th of April. So, tomorrow night, we will have Aria Perez as our guest speaker. And she, she will be sharing with us the topic, Basun and I, our journey together. So for more info, please go to our JPO Facebook page and press the like and follow button. If you want to, if you want to rewatch and listen to this broadcast again, it will be available after this broadcast has end. Uh, the recorded live broadcast will be available for you to watch at our page. So you guys have been great. Thank you so much for all the question. I hope you guys got the answer that you wanted. So, um, so for those. Uh, that want your answer to be typed, you can stay put, don't go anywhere yet. Uh, Mr. Howard Ng will be answering your question in writings on the question and answer part. So that's it for tonight. Be safe, be safe, stay safe, and be healthy, and please do stay at home. So for at the end of tonight's program, I will lead the prayer. Uh, please pray in whatever faith you believe in for the COVID-19. So, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Allahumma inni a'udhu bika minal barsi wal jinnai wal jizani wa min sayyil asram. Oh Allah, I seek your refuge from leprosy, insanity, mutilation, and from all serious illness. Bismillahilladhi la yadhuru ma'is misri'un fil ardi wa la fis sama'i wa huma asami'un alim. In the name of Allah, with whose name nothing on the earth or in the heaven can cause harm, and He is the All Hearing and the All Knowing. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasanah fil akhirati hasanah tawakina azabna. Wa sallamu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alhi wa sabihi wa sallam. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alamin. Alright, that's it for tonight. Have a good night, and see you all the same time tomorrow until 14th of April. Goodbye. Good night.